We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in to one of ACC's messages. As you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're on social media, use the hashtag you belong at ACC if God taught you anything during this message. We want to get to know you. So check out our online community by watching our live service at arundelcc.org live. This is where you can interact with other viewers in the chat, fill out a prayer request, and follow along with message notes. And we believe that God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Well, good morning, ACC. How are you guys? All right, well, it's great to be with you guys. Whether you are joining us here in the auditorium, over in the lounge, or online, we just want to give you a special warm welcome. And, uh, you know, today um, we are going to be continuing. In fact, we're going to be finishing. We're going to be bringing to a close our series on the unshakables. We've been talking for the last few weeks about the unshakable parts of the faith, like who's Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit, the triune God, um, looking at scripture. And today we're actually going to be talking about the church because it's very interesting because we talk about all these things, but at the end of the day, as the church of the living God, the question is, what are we going to do with all this? What do we believe about the church? And we'll be looking at that in a moment, but uh, let's first go to the Lord with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We ask, Lord, that you would prepare our hearts, prepare our minds, and Lord, that as you download all these things into our hearts and our minds, Father, that ultimately it would be found in our actions, that we would not simply be hearers of the word, but that we would be doers of the word. And Father, I ask that you would give me clarity of speech, that you would give me boldness to speak your word. And Father, I ask that you would just move us. We ask in Jesus Christ's name. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. amen. Well, you know, there is a, a story. You know, many years ago, there was, there was a groom. And as we're talking about the church, there was this groom who was at a church building. And he had his tux on. He was looking to the nines. Everything was going great. And the moment, the room, much like this, it was full, and, and there was doors, and they were, you know, they just open up. And he had not seen the bride, and suddenly it opened. And to his astonishment, this bride, she, she had mascara going down her face. She looked like, you know, it was clearly at one time a white dress, very nice, beautiful, flowing dress. But it looked like it had gone for a roll in the mud. Like maybe she had been in a fight because there was a little bit of blood here or there. And it looked like she was beat up, torn, tattered. But when he looked, all he saw was beauty. All he saw was beauty. He didn't see anything else. Because if you haven't figured it out by now, I'm talking about Jesus and the church. When we talk about the church, there are these images that were given in the Bible of the church. And one of those images, one of those symbolisms that we see is that the church is called the bride of Christ. That makes him a groomsman. He's looking to the nines. But when we look at the church oftentimes, let's just be honest, we don't always see, the world doesn't always see what Jesus sees. Sometimes, sometimes it looks like we've been through some fights. It, it looks like the imperfect. Let's just be honest. Have you ever had a, a uh, ch do you have a church hurt story at all? Anybody? Anybody? And a lot of you guys are not being honest. <laughs> but the truth is, we've all at some point or another, if you've been part of a church family for any amount of time, at some point or another, something has not gone the way that maybe you would have liked, you intended. It's, it's something that, if you've been in the military or you're familiar with military language, uh, we refer to as friendly fire. Friendly fire is maybe you are in the battlelands and you are saying, hey, I need some help, I need some support, and you give your coordinates 
and you give the coordinates of, of where you need the attack to happen. And unfortunately, something happens between that conversation and them, and suddenly the bombs are coming down on you. You're being shot at by the people who are supposed to be helping you. And within the church, friendly fire looks in different forms. Sometimes, sometimes it may even be as simple as, well, I'm not gossiping, but we need to pray for this person. That's just a simple one. The difficult ones that I would say is as someone that I was talking with earlier today, or earlier this week shared, they said, sometimes friendly fire is just revenge. Ooh, ooh, that is tough. I thought that we were supposed to be the people of God. I thought, that, I, I thought that we believed that Jesus died for our sins and rose from the dead and, and now we've been buried in Christ and we've been raised to newness of life. And, you know, I don't know about you guys, but early on in my walk with Jesus, I actually thought that we were going to live by this. I thought that everybody was. And then I found that sometimes we want to pick and choose. Sometimes... Sometimes I'm certain that I've done friendly fire without even knowing it, unfortunately. And yet God sees so much more in us, and we're going to talk about that today. But before that, we've been talking about the unshakable things of the faith, and each week we've been looking up here, and we've been saying together what we believe as a church. And this is, this is you know, you may put it in some different words and such, but this is what our overseers, what we have come up with as a church. So I want to encourage you to join as we're going to say this together. The purpose of the church, consisting of all believers everywhere, is to fulfill the last command of Jesus. We believe the church is part of God's design to lead all people back to him. The church encourages and supports followers of Jesus while glorifying God through various forms of corporate service and worship. Christians are equipped with spiritual gifts which enable them to minister in the church. So when we talk about the church, I think that oftentimes we're going to get to the how, like how do we do some of these things, but oftentimes it's important to start with the why. And we see that a little bit in this statement. The why, ultimately, you know, it's going to be because Jesus died on the cross for our sins, because Jesus was resurrected from the dead. But within this, I think that a lot of the why really stems from some of Jesus' last words after the resurrection. He says this in Matthew 28, verses 18 and 19. It says, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now, when I hear these words, maybe you're like me. Early on in my walk with Jesus, I was told that to follow Jesus, to look at this, it's simply go and make disciples. Like just, just go and start teaching them. And, and it was more, a little bit more about just simply information is what it felt like. But what I didn't understand is that antiquity, the idea of a rabbi was not just to give knowledge. Like when you were growing up and your teachers, you know, they, they give you stuff. And now, you know, your math teacher, I'm assuming that you are all mathematicians now, correct? You got the same grades as I did. I know. But within it, the purpose of a rabbi was that you become like the rabbi. You follow in the dust of the rabbi because you want to learn everything from him. And after you have learned everything from him, like the disciples did, after three years, Jesus comes to this place. And he says, I think you're ready. I think that you're ready to make disciples. In essence, he's saying, I believe that you can be what I am. Now, he's not saying that we can become God. But within it, we can be his followers. We become like Jesus, and we model that life as we make disciples, as we go along the way. It's not just, hey, they're a minister, they're a pastor. No, 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 no. If you count yourself a follower of Jesus, you are a disciple of Jesus, and you have been called to go 
to live in the dust of the rabbi, to be an example of what the rabbi is like, to be like the rabbi, and to raise up others in that. In fact, it goes on in verse 20, it says, teach these new disciples, teach these new disciples to show up every Sunday and um, be good people. Be good people and, and, and make nuclear families. I'm, wait, that's not in here. It says, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And I love that last line because Jesus is saying, you're not going to be on your own. Even when you feel like you're alone, we, we, we feel like that, especially when we're making disciples, when we're teaching other people. What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? Sometimes it, it can be kind of isolating. You can be like, am I, am I messing up at this? Am I doing this the right way? But Jesus says, teach them, the new disciples, to obey. See, there's a difference between hearing and obeying. For example, you've got a teenager, or you were that teenager, and you say, hey, I need you to take out the garbage. No problem, Dad. I got it. And then the next day, I thought I said to... Take care. Hey, take care of the garbage. And this happens like several days, and it's overflowing. And you go and you say, hey, I thought I said to, to take out the garbage. I heard you, Dad. No, you didn't. You may have been hearing, but you weren't listening because listening means action. And so it's not enough to simply know the words of Jesus. We have to actually live by the scriptures. We have to actually obey what he's calling us to. As a church, as a church, we exist to be a foreknowledge of God's kingdom. And people see that through our lives together. But, but as a foretaste of that kingdom, ultimately, we are called to simply wake people up to Jesus. That's it. Just wake people up to Jesus because the world is looking. Now, when it comes to waking people up to Jesus and what it looks like to live as a church, I, I love, I love our church. Now, we're not a perfect church, but I love the things that God has been doing here. Right now, you know, we, we just saw someone get baptized this morning, and maybe that's your next step. If it is, uh, we would love to come alongside you, but as of today, right now, there have been 82 baptisms here at ACC this year. Yeah. 82 baptisms. But you know what really excites me about that? Is because I remember standing up here last year and saying, you know, right now we are on our way to record baptisms. The numbers today are higher than they were at this time last year. And last year had ba record baptisms. The year before that, there were record baptisms. Now, I say that not because, yes, I rejoice in these things, but it's not simply about what God has done in the past, but what is he doing right now? What is he doing now? We don't want to live just in the past. We need to live in the present because we want to continue to partner with God and what he's doing. But 82 baptisms, we have ha we're having 12 Go Adventures next year, and I hope that you'll participate in one. This year, we have eight We'll have an opportunity to pray over one of those teams later on after the message. But eight teams. Last year, it was four. The year before that, it was two. And the year before that, two. We were going through COVID. But God has been doing something and growing us as a church. I could, talk, I could go on. I could talk about the fact that we have between 40 and 50 life groups. And it's not enough. Maybe God's calling you to lead a life group. Whatever it is, at the end of the day, I love what Oswald J. Smith says. I love it today because I feel like we're, we're living rightly as a church. And when you're, when you're living rightly, when you're doing the right things, you feel good instead of convicted. But here's what he says. He says, any church that is not seriously involved in helping fulfill the Great Commission has forfeited its biblical right to exist. Man, that's tough if you're not living it. But if you are living it, you're like, yeah, we're doing that. We're waking people up to Jesus. We, we exist to see people transformed and released by the love of Jesus. That's why we exist as a church. 
Because we understand this first point. You're going to serve somebody. You're going to serve somebody. And, and for some of you guys, you might recognize this tagline from a song by Bob Dylan. He says, it might be the devil or it might be the Lord, but you're going to serve somebody. And for some, you might feel like, well, I'm not serving God. I'm not even sure what I believe in, in but I, 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 I'm like, I'm for me. I'm not serving the devil. I hate to tell you, you got two options. If we're serving ourselves, if we're serving our job, maybe, maybe you're a workaholic, maybe, maybe, maybe your kids are your idol. I don't know. We got two choices. And if you're in between, you've already made your choice, and it's not the Lord. Now, if, if you're here and you're new here and you're like, man, John, that's kind of tough. Maybe you're kind of whispering off to the side going, hey, maybe it's time to go. Listen, I want you to know this is a safe place to ask questions. I just say this because it's true, but within it, sometimes there's going to be times that we're going to push a little. And sometimes I have to be pushed as well. Sometimes I have to have truth spoken to me. We all need that at some point or another. In Philippians 2.2, 2, Paul, an early follower of Jesus, he says this, Then make, my, make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. He's speaking of unity. We see this in the New Testament so often. We need unity. Just like in a marriage, you need unity. In a, in a, in a friendship, you need unity. In a family, you need unity. Sometimes we feel like that adage, good fences make for good neighbors. And we want to fence off different people, not in the kingdom of God. When it comes to unity, it's important to understand that, you know, as a church, we say in essentials liberty, in essentials unity and non-essentials liberty and all things love. And so when we talk about the unshakable things of the faith, these are things that, guess what, we're all going to agree on this. We're all going to agree on these things. Now, sometimes how we go about doing things. As a church, we may disagree. This is a church worldwide. Sometimes there's things that go on. I think of uh, last month, I was in Sierra Leone, and I was uh, teaching a class on ecclesiology to pastors. And ecclesiology is simply the study of the church. And I found that there were two pastors, and they were debating back and forth. Specifically, what they were debating about was the length of the service. Amen, Pastor. Amen. <laughs> and I, for a moment, just for fun, think of that number. What is that perfect number in your mind of how long a church gathering should be? Just, you know, just, just think about that. Now, one of these pastors, he was advocating for, for, uh, uh, for the way that they do church in Sierra Leone. And the other one was saying, listen, church is too long. It is way too long. I mean, seriously, y'all get together, everybody gets together from 9 a.m. to 1 o'clock. Four hours is too long. And I thought to myself, amen, amen, amen. <laughs> I've gone to churches that are two hours, and the pastor's saying, I know I've gone over a little bit. I'm like, a little? Man. But, the other guy, but then the guy, he, he goes on, he says, listen, Y'all get together between 9 and 1 o'clock. People are too tired. So our church, we started getting together between 9 and 12. Three hours? This is what you're advocating for? Dang, that is a long... And y'all thought that an hour and 15 minutes was long, right? But within it, they were going back and forth on that. And there are times that over the years that maybe if you've lived for any amount of time and you've been part of the church for any amount of time, you might remember things like the worship wars of the 80s. Some of you are like, oh, it's a little bit further. It was the 70s. Because y'all were moving from, and yes, I have to say y'all because I'm speaking to everybody. But within it, you were moving from hymns to choruses. Ooh, scandalous. You were moving from the hymnal to the overhead projector. 
And some of y'all remember moving those transparencies, and you got my respect. You got my respect. But things had to move forward, and, and some people wanted to move forward. Other people didn't want to move forward. And listen, don't think that this is just our generation, because listen, we've got drums. Those are of the devil. Pianos, Satan's handiwork. This, this was like 100 years ago and has continued to go on some of these things. Some people really do hold to this and they are trying to be faithful to the Lord. But there are things that we need to let go of sometimes. Like one of the first churches that I uh, preached at in the early 2000s, they really needed to let go of that orange shag carpeting in the auditorium. <laughs> it's emblazoned in my mind. I don't remember anything else except for that. But within it, it's important to understand that the message never changes. It's always waking people up to Jesus. It's always making disciples who make disciples who make disciples. Because at the end of the day, we only exist for this generation. And if we do not come alongside this generation... There is no next generation. Children's ministry isn't next gen. It's this gen. High school student ministry, it's not next gen. It's this gen. It's this generation. We're accountable for that. And we may adapt the way that we go about doing some of these things because guess what? Culture changes. But the message never changes at all. Now, the second point is this. Grace is messy. So leave room for more. Can you do me a favor? Just look to the person to your right or your left and just say, leave room for grace. Leave room for more. Because I'm going to need it, right? And I'm going to have to give it to you. But within this, understand that, understand that grace is messy. It's not convenient. It'll take time but Jesus, he made it really clear. You know, the question was, how many times should I forgive somebody? Seven times? That sounds, that sounds good. And Jesus is like, seven times what? Seven times 70. Well, Jesus, I did what you said. I have a journal over here, and I've been keeping track, and we're at 500. I have gone above and beyond. I think Jesus in that moment would say, did I say 490? I meant 1,000. I meant 2,000. I meant 3,000. Forgive as you have been forgiven. Oh, man, that is a tough one, Jesus. I'm going to be here all day. Yeah, that's the point. That's the point. Oftentimes, I think that we are willing to, as a church, we're willing to give more grace to people who don't know Jesus. But then we talk about brothers and sisters we talk about the family of God. And for some of you right now, you might, as you're hearing the word family of God, you're hearing that word family. And remember, you've been at work, and they're like, we're a family here. Why'd you fire the family last week then? <laughs> and so you see out in the world how family's not supposed to be. Maybe you've grown up in a dysfunctional family. Welcome to the team. We all did. And you look at the church, and you're like, oh, this feels like a dysfunctional family. Welcome to the family. <laughs> if you're not dysfunctional in any way, shape, or form, you're either not being honest with yourself, or we really need to listen to you. <laughs> listen, it is the family of God. And while that word family may feel a little cliche at times because society has kind of put it out there, it's like saying thank you to somebody and saying my, hearing my pleasure. Um, and it might work at Chick-fil-A, but it doesn't work at McDonald's, right? <laughs> there are places that we should be able to believe it. And places that, do you really mean that? Do you really mean that? Like, would you really, because my family, if something happened in my, fa in my family, if the house burned down, I know that my family would come alongside me. Yeah, that's the kind of church that we want to be. That's the kind of church that we seek to be. That's why we do things like outreach. That's why we have life groups, so that if you're at the hospital, you're struggling, whatever it is, we're working with each other. 
We're working and we're trying to be what God has called us to be. And so often it's like, well, if I could just get back to the church in the New Testament, man, everything would be great. You have not read the New Testament, have you? I think of the words of Jesus spoken to the Apostle John in the book of Revelation. He says, John, I want, I want you to write, down, write this out. I, I got seven letters. There's seven churches, and they need to hear this message. And out of those, five of those churches are not doing well. They're not doing well. In fact, one of those, he says, y'all think that you're a church. Uh-uh. He calls them a synagogue of Satan. You want some strong words. Man. Those are strong words. Jesus is not holding back. But there's two churches that they do have it together. And what does he say to them? Keep doing it. In fact, by the way, all y'all should be reading all these letters, including the two that are doing it right. You need to have that warning. You need to see what it could be, and you need to continue to live out the gospel message. Be that foretaste of the kingdom. And so how do we do this? Well, some, we've got a few verses that say it really clearly. In Galatians 5.13, it says, For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, family language, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. It's not about us. 1 Peter 4.10, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Hebrews, Hebrews 10, 25, and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near, and that's the return of Jesus. He died, he rose from the dead, and he has gone to, to prepare a place that we may be where he is for all eternity. We hear Galatians. This is written by an early follower of Jesus named Paul. First Peter. It's written by Peter. Hebrews. I think it might be Paul or Apollos, but we don't actually know who the author is. But the point is, we have three different voices from the early church saying, it's not about you. It's not about your likes. It's not about your dislikes. It's all about him. When it comes to worship, one of the things that over the years I've shared with people, and I mean it well-meaning and loving, I've let people know, you've got two choices. You can worship to your songs, or you can watch your grandkids worship. You got to choose. Now, as a church, we, we, we believe that we have, that we're worshiping in a way that our kids can also worship. And sometimes we put in hymns as well, because listen, uh, we need to know our history as well. And there's some amazing songs out there. But as a church, it's all about raising up that next generation, this present generation. And in my mind, I will tell you, I will probably be in my 80s, 90s, and I will hear something, and I'll be like, oh, I don't know if I can worship by this. I hope I never have that. It's much like I heard many years, I heard years ago, uh, a pastor by the name of Francis Chan. Somebody came up to him after the service, and the guy said, I didn't like that worship. I'm certain that he stood like this, too, you know, because that's how, you know. I didn't like that worship. And Francis, he says, well, it's a good thing we weren't worshiping you. We want to be making disciples who make disciples. We want to be a, a church of the living God that reflects the grace that we have been shared. And to share it with one another. To share it and live it out before the world. One of the questions, though, that pastors oftentimes will hear, ministers will hear, well, when, when should I leave? When can I leave? Which immediately, you know, you're like, are you looking at leaving? What's, what's going on? But when... When to leave. And the first thing that I would say, I think this is, if you remember nothing else out of this particular portion, after seeking reconciliation repeatedly, like long-suffering, 
That word's also translated as patience, but sometimes it feels like long suffering, doesn't it? Sometimes it's tough. It's like, man, but they keep on and, and here and here and here. But first, we should be seeking reconciliation. Some of these come up, there's, there's, I'm sure that there's probably more, but here's five. The first one is relational conflict that doesn't seem to be able to be overcome as a whole. We see this in Acts chapter 15. Paul and Barnabas, these guys were like BFFs. I don't understand how Paul couldn't get along with Barnabas. I mean, literally, son of encouragement. It's, his name says that he's supposed to be a cool guy, that you want to be around him. And they just could not do it because of a situation with a guy named John Mark. Another one, doctrinal. This is the one that I would say, hey, listen, if there's, if there's any hill that I'm going to die on, it's going to be the unshakables. If somebody, if somebody is up and they're teaching and they say um, Jesus is not fully God, that he's not fully man, that he's either one or the other, but he's not both, whew, we got problems. If they said, you know, I don't really believe, you know, the, the resurrection, it's more of a myth. Hold on, wait a minute. Paul makes it really clear. If Jesus wasn't resurrected, we are still dead in our sins. And we should be pitied. Pitied. Doctrine matters. Doctrine matters. Theology matters. We're not just doing theological backflips. There's things that, you know, doctrines that, listen, uh, you can have a, a, a particular view on something and I'll have a different view and that's okay. But there are things that they are unshakable. They're unshakable. And so we do die on these hills. And you know, at times, it may be that we have to remove ourselves. But before that even happens, we need to go and talk to them to find out, did we understand what they said? And maybe, much like Apollos, when Priscilla went to Apollos and said, um, I don't think you're quite understanding that fully. Let me come alongside you. And corrected him. Another one is spiritual abuse. Another one is family needs. Your family has particular needs that the church is not able to take care of and is unwilling for that matter. Sometimes it's as simple as I remember many years ago going to a church and um, it was a very, very small church in Virginia and I was in seminary and I walked in and I was the only dude in the church. I was the only one. And I had kids and there was no children's ministry and it became very clear that when we went there my wife was going to be the children's minister to our kids. And it was not going to work out. That just was something our family need. Um, another one is lacking fruit. You've been there. You've been trying to produce fruit, trying, trying, trying. And it's like hitting your head up against the wall. And you're like, I'm trying here. But, you know, we need to be, like, we can't just be talkers of the word. We need to actually do it. This is a frustration that I've seen in people over the years. Because at the end of the day, there's a day and an hour that we don't know. That Jesus is going to be ready, be coming back. And we want to be ready. We want to live with expectation. In fact, Jesus, he thinks that this is so important that in Matthew 24 and 25, Jesus gives tons of warnings about his return. He talks about false prophets and false teachers. He talks about it's going to be, when I come, it's going to be like the days of Noah. Noah was building that ark for like a hundred years, day in and day out. And guess what? The day that the rain started coming down, people were still getting married. People were still going and buying property. They were doing everything, and they didn't see it coming. They weren't waiting for it. We're waiting for it. Noah was waiting for the rain, so he prepared for the rain. Build an ark. The day or the hour is not known. The father's going to tell him, hey, now, now it's ready. Much like in, in the first century, when the husband went, when he was going to get married, he would go and he would build on to his father's house. And when the father said, all right, it's done, go get your bride. Go get your bride. We're in the same place. He's waiting to hear it's good enough. So I got to tell you, 2,000 years of waiting, that's going to be an amazing place, I'm telling you. But within it, he also talks about the sheep and the goats. And then he goes on and he tells this story, this parable of the ten bridesmaids. 
Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. So you got these bridesmaids, so you, these, these you know, silly girls who are probably wearing um, dresses that make the bride look good because that's how that works, right? But they've been, they've been up, they've had their pizza, they've been watching movies, they've been waiting, whatever it is, and, but in the midst of it, they've fallen asleep. Now the wise, the wise ones, they had not only enough oil for now, but for later. But the foolish ones, they didn't prepare. They weren't ready. And so at midnight, when they didn't expect, it says in verse 6, at midnight they were roused by the shout, look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out and meet him. And immediately the foolish ones, they realized, I'm out of oil. And they're like, give me some of your oil. Give me some of your oil. And, and, and the wise ones, they're like, hold on, if I give that to you, then I'm not going to have any. Neither one of us are going to be. And so why don't you go up and get some oil? And at the end of the day, it says in verse 11, later when the other bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he called back, believe me, I do not know you. So you too must keep watch, for you do not know the day or the hour of my return. We don't know what was making that groom have to wait. We don't know if maybe there was, there were, there was some negotiating going on with the in-laws. We, we don't know what it was, but at the end of the day, he shows up, and five are ready, and five are not. And when we hear that language of, you know, they'll be outside and there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That gnashing of teeth, sometimes people are like, oh, it's because of the fires. No, the gnashing of teeth is anger. How could you let me in? I deserve it. I was a good person, whatever. I don't know what they'll say. But this is why we're given these warnings. So that we know, guess what? There's going to be a time. There's going to be a day. And this is where th point three comes in, and that is the world is waiting. And I would add the world is waiting on the church to be the church that God has called us to be. So that they can recognize that there's something different about you. There's something different amongst you. You guys do things differently. You actually, like you actually care about each other? Wait, let me get this straight. What? Wait, so... So you're struggling, but you have peace, and you have people around you who are doing, you're doing life together? Like, you don't just show up on Sunday, you actually do life together? Yeah. Yeah, I know, it sounds crazy. I, I read it in the book of Acts, and, and, and we're trying to actually do what it says here. We really do actually believe this. We believe this as a church, because we see what Jesus said in John 13, 34, and 35, he says, So now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. He's saying, listen, you want, you're, you're wondering, are they going to get it? He's almost asking, do you get it? Do you get it? We can't live life alone. We're not meant to live life alone. We're meant to live together as the community of God. And the world is waiting, is longing for that message of hope. But they don't want to just hear it. They're from Missouri. Show me. I want to see it. And I know that you want to see it. I know that you want to experience it. And some of you are, and some of you only to a certain degree. But God has more. God has more. When I think of that bride that I talked about at the very beginning, she was torn, tattered, and everything else, but I, I, I think of my wedding day. You know, Pastor Matt was talking about today is, is, is his anniversary. And that's awesome. And we celebrate with him. But I think of my wedding day when, when those doors opened and I saw the most beautiful bride ever, ever. And Pastor Matt and I back, went back and forth on this and, 
And, and he said, well, you weren't at my wedding, so, you know. But she was the most beautiful bride. She, she, she is. And I had tears coming down my face. She had tears coming on, down her face. I was a hot mess for the right reasons. And that's how much Jesus loves the church. You want to know how to act? You want to know how to love? Jesus died for us. Forgive others the way that you've been forgiven. Give love the way that you've been given. That's, that's how we become unshakable, living it out together. So this week as we look at the what now, God, I just want to ask, what's your next step to walking as the church? Is it worshiping regularly? Coming together communally as it is. Serving sacrificially, not just out of convenience, but it actually cost you something. Giving generously. Connecting relationally. Life groups are going to start back up. If you haven't been with your life group or you don't have one, it's, it's time to start getting ready for that. Grow personally. Maybe it's you just show up on Sunday morning and that's, that's it. It's time to go beyond that, to connect with God. And I've added another one to our catalyst, okay? Because I think that these all encompass it. And that is live expectantly. Live as if Jesus could come back at any time. Because at the end of the day, you know, you may have been asking questions, but there's going to be a day when the doors are going to close. We want you there with us. God wants you there with us. So today, if it's just putting your faith in Jesus, make today the day. If today it's getting baptized, make today the day. Let me pray with you. Father, we know that we are sinners, but we know that you sent your son, Jesus, to make us saints, to bring forgiveness. If there's anybody there here today who has never received Christ as their Lord and Savior, just pray with me. Father, I ask, I recognize that I'm a sinner. And I know that you sent your son Jesus to die on my behalf. And I am now choosing to place my faith in Jesus. I believe that he died for my sins, that he rose from the dead, and I accept him now as my personal Lord and Savior. God, please help us. Help me to live for you, to live with you. And I don't have it all figured out, but I know that you do. Father, I bless, pray a blessing over your church, over these people who have just received you as Lord and Savior. And I ask, Father, that you would do exceedingly more than we could ever ask or we can imagine in accordance with your word. And we ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen. Wow. We are so thankful for the truth that was shared in the message today. Please know that we as a church are praying that what you have learned today and the truths that God has put deep into your heart will manifest and grow into something amazing. You can experience that with other believers at ACC on Sunday mornings at 710 Aqua Heart Road. And remember, you belong at ACC.